Well, we are going to continue back in our study of Second Peter. It was good to get back into it last week after a bit of a break and uh, look at this matter of a sure word in a deceitful world. And uh, in, in chapter 1, and uh, still in chapter 1, spending a bit of time there, we actually slowed down to look through this list that we've been starting through and working through of the different character qualities that uh, God wants us to develop in our lives. And it's interesting, you know, as I've been reading uh, Second Peter and you study through it, and it always seems to me that when I'm, I'm reading through and we're studying a book, there's so much relevance to us in the world that we live in. And this week I had a phone conversation, which I'll share a little bit about in a moment, that really reminded me of uh, just how, how what Peter wrote 2,000 years ago is really so relevant to us today. And we think about what Peter did write, and I think when Peter wrote letters and when God inspired these writers to write their letters, they gave them a direction or a strategy in how they should do so. And we see that Peter has a specific strategy in this. Now, Peter's going to warn uh, his readers, he's going to warn the believers of the dangers of those who peddle false doctrine and false teaching. That's his main subject. But before he even gets to that, this first chapter particularly, he, he wants to emphasise the things that are true. You know, you need to know, before you start looking at the things that are wrong and false, you need to be reminded of what's true and what's true particularly for us as believers. So he starts out by reminding us as fellow believers of our foundation of our faith in Jesus Christ, who we are in Christ, what we've received because of union with him, and all the great blessings and spiritual promises that we have and the resources that we have in Jesus Christ. That's what he's done in his opening verses. But now as we see, as we move on to verses 5 through 7, he's urging us and, uh, and, and his belief, those that are reading it and us as well to grow in Christ's likeness. That's God's desire, that's God's purpose for every Christian, that we would grow and become more like the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, at the end of this letter, he sums the whole letter up by saying, uh, but grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And uh, it's as we grow in the Lord, as we understand our salvation, yes, we need to be saved, but as we grow in the Lord, that God will build us up, as it were, establish us in our faith. And as a result, we'll be able to resist those who try to deceive us, who try to peddle false doctrines. And there are so many in the world today, and these are those that try to corrupt our Christian walk. You know, Satan can't take away our salvation, but he can certainly ruin our testimony, and he can cause us to make a shipwreck of our faith. You know, a shipwreck is still a ship, but it's gone off on the rocks, and it's not doing what it's supposed to. It's not fulfilling its purpose. And, and God wants us to grow in the Lord. It's as we grow in the Lord that we'll be able to resist the, uh, the, all the things that are peddled, like I said, by false teachers. And they appeal to, a lot of those things appeal to people, uh, but they're wrong and they're against God. And we see a lot of that in the church today. In short, you could say that our spiritual growth prevents us from being falling into spiritual deception. And so it's important that we grow. And Peter's not the only one to speak of this in the New Testament. In fact, when you, as I've read through uh, the New Testament recently, and I've been spending some time looking at some of the different letters, you'll, you'll find that pretty much all of the New Testament writers have the same approach. The, the idea of the need for us to, to firstly, obviously be saved, to be established in, in, in trust in Jesus Christ alone, but then also to grow in our faith and how this helps us against the attacks of false teachers. For example, uh, here's what the Apostle Paul writes in Colossians. In Colossians 2, he says, As ye have therefore received Jesus Christ, uh, the Lord, so walk ye in him. How did you receive Christ? By faith, through grace. That's how we continue to walk in him. He says, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith. So this is talking about our Christian growth, being established in our faith and our salvation and growing in that as you've been taught and abounding there in thanksgiving. Why? Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men and after rudiments of the world and not after Christ. So Paul's telling the believers in Colossae, 
you need to keep growing in the Lord. You need to be grounded in his word and in the gospel and what Christ has done for you because there are people that are trying to teach other things, other things that would deceive you and lead you away. For some, for those who don't truly know Christ, it is to prevent them from coming to Christ. For those who are true believers, it's to kind of uh, send them off the rails, as it were, to make them ineffective for the Lord. John, in his letter, writes as well uh, in 1 John 2, 24 to 26, he says, Let that therefore abide in you which you've heard from the beginning, talking about the word of God, talking about our faith in Christ. If that which you've heard from the beginning shall remain in you. John was the one that wrote in John's gospel when Jesus said, Abide in me and I in you. And he's probably got that thinking as he's talking about abiding and remaining. He says, uh, if you, that which you've heard from the beginning shall remain in you, you shall also continue in the Son and in the Father. This is the promise that he has promised us, even eternal life. He mentions the reason he writes this, the reason he is encouraging this. The re these things I've written you concerning them that seduce you. So the point I'm trying to show you here is that God, throughout his word, encourages us that the way that we combat those False teachings of the world, those things and the, the attacks of Satan and those who would seek to derail us is by growing. You know, we want to continue to grow just like this little acorn so we can become like that oak tree that's behind it and that not, as, as the scriptures tell us, not swayed around and not tossed about by every wind of doctrine. You know, a little plant can be buffeted around by the wind, but a, a big tree withstands that. And so in the same way, God wants us to grow up in our faith. And that involves us some effort on our part. Firstly, in knowing what is true about God's word and what is true about our salvation, but then also applying these things to our lives. And I said that that is, is what Peter's talking about. And it's so relevant for us today. You know, the other day I was uh, having a phone conversation with a, a Christian friend, a uh, longtime brother in the Lord, and he lives in a little country town and uh, there isn't any really good uh, churches in that town so he's been seeking for some Christians to fellowship with and he was telling me about some believers that he'd sort of connected with and they were having a bit of a fellowship together but one of the things that he was concerned about was the fact that they didn't really have a lot of interest in the gospel and they didn't have a lot of interest in spiritual growth he said they're very nice people but they just seem to be very comfortable in themselves and whenever I bring up the matter of you know, our need to, to know who we are in Christ uh, and how we need to grow, we need to apply these things to our lives, they seem to, he says, it seems to ruffle their feathers. And uh, that was interesting. And then as we continued talking, he, talked, he mentioned to me about some of the different strange doctrines that some of these people have gone off into and how they're pursuing all sorts of things that are really not in the Bible or taking a Bible verse out of context and some of them rather, I guess, wacky or just unbiblical. And that reminded me of what we've just talked about here. If you're not growing in the Lord, you're going to be susceptible to these things. And today, so many people are. And if you're not grounded in the gospel and growing in, the, in Christ, you're susceptible to these false teachers. And, and Peter's going to tell us in chapter 2 that these false teachers, they want to make merchandise of you. Literally, you know, they want, they want to fleece the flock as it were, but they also want to, um, you know, deceive people. Now, thankfully, my Christian friend realised this and he's realised the need to perhaps find some, another place to fellowship and I'm praying that he will. Um, but the sad thing is what he has experienced there is actually very common today in Christianity. It's common not only today amongst Christians, but in churches as well. Uh, too many uh, churches, too many believers... Uh, consider the, the plain teaching of the word of God uh, as sort of like, oh, you know, I'm not really all that interested in that. When I say the plain teaching, the teaching of just the simple things, you know, our salvation, who we are in Christ, uh, how we grow in Christ, how we apply these things to our life. You see, a lot of people today, they want something sensational. 
They want the next new big thing. They want some new insight. And, uh, and then even when you do start to talk and call people to maybe godliness or holiness or certain standards of living, they say, well, you're just being legalistic. And they kind of push it away as, as being like, you know, well, I have liberty in Christ. Well, we have liberty in Christ, but we're not to use that liberty for license to, to just do whatever we want. We need to know what God wants us to do. And that's really what Peter's um, highlighting to us in, in this opening part of the letter, is that we would understand our salvation, but also we would be committed to spiritual growth, to applying these things that we read from the Word of God to our lives. And so we come back to this, uh, these verses 5 through 8, in which Peter is actually telling us, yes, w- we need to give all diligence to add to our faith certain things. And he lists seven different qualities here and let's go back and look at them again last week we looked at the first two we're going to look at another two this week and then in the next week we'll look at the the three remaining ones so second peter chapter one verses five through eight and and uh, lord willing today we'll see about how we can cultivate some of these things in our lives particularly the matter of temperance or self-control and patience and steadfastness or endurance second peter chapter one verses five through eight And Peter's writing, Beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. To virtue, knowledge. To knowledge, temperance. To temperance, patience. To patience, godliness. To godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful, in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, let's pray as we consider those words this morning and thank the Lord for our time together. Dear Lord, we thank you for, again, your word. We thank you for how it instructs us and teaches us. But Lord, also we thank you for the salvation you've given us in Jesus Christ. Lord, there's nothing we could do or can do, Lord, to... to, um, earn that salvation we know it's through by grace through faith in your son we thank you that he willingly came and submitted himself to uh, your will submitted himself to the evils of this world even uh, in in that they came to crucify him and yet lord we know that through that crucifixion through giving his life in our place lord we have eternal life as we think about the the finished work of Jesus Christ and and what he accomplished for us. And so, Lord, as we look to you today, we thank you for our salvation, but we also want to grow in our Christian walk. Lord, we don't want to be tossed around by all these strange doctrines. We don't want to just be living for ourselves. Lord, we understand, Lord, that whatever time we have left here on this earth, Lord, is is to be submitted and yielded to you. And, Lord, we know that you have the best plans for us, Lord, we know that your, your purposes and your plans for us are better than anything that we can have for ourselves. And Lord, so we want to just uh, thank you today as we look into your word and we understand these things that we're to grow in by your grace and in your power. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So those seven things, just to go back to it, was that we're to add to our faith is we had virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love now last week we looked at the first two just to remind you we were told to add to our faith virtue and virtue is a word that's a little bit hard to pin down but it had a a quite a um, substantial uh, meaning back to the greek philosophers of those days and then also carried over into christianity the idea means to be excellent excellent in particularly in fulfilling one's purpose we said, you know, that could be true of a, a, a sword or a knife if, it, if, it, if it, it was excellent, if it cut well. It would be true of a warrior if he uh, stayed under the battle and didn't cower away, that he would be excellent. But for the Christian, it means that we are to be excellent in fulfilling the purpose that God has for our lives. And what's God's purpose for our lives? That we might glorify him and become more like his son jesus christ you know for us to be christians means that we're in christ that means that our, our because of what christ has done for him we've been placed in union with him and what god wants to do is to transform us and to mold us and shape us to 
to be more like Christ in our attitudes and our actions in the way that we live. And in doing so, we will give glory to him, not to us. It's not for our own pride. It's the fact that we bring glory to the excellencies of God. God's purpose is we become like Christ, that we grow in Christ likeness. This is what we call our sanctification. You know, the moment you trust in Christ, God declares you righteous. That's what we, the term is justification. It's just as if I'd never sinned. God looks at us that way. Um, there'll be a time when God takes us out of this world to, from, from sin. But right now he is growing us and he is sanctifying us. And that is actually God's will. We read in Thessalonians, for this is the will of God, even your sanctification. God's desire is to continue for us to grow. God meets us where we are in Christ. It's wonderful. But he doesn't want us to stay where we are. He wants us to grow. God's placed this a desire in every believer. You know, when you, when you become a believer, God puts a new nature in you and with that a new desire to please him, to serve him and to live for him. And to have virtue means that we become committed to that. It's not just something that we go, oh, well, you know, it's fine. I've got, I, I'm, I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. You know, <laughs> that's, that's fine. It's great we're going to heaven, you know. But it also looks and said, well, how can I, how can I glorify and please God in this present life? And, and having virtue means that we have commitment and courage as well. Courage in a, in a world that doesn't want to do that, that doesn't want us to do that. And so we are to have uh, virtue, we're told, to add to our faith. And then it, on top of that, if we're going to uh, reflect the excellencies of Christ, if we're going to do that, we need to know what that means. And therefore, uh, Peter says that we need to add to our virtue knowledge. In other words, a knowledge of Jesus Christ, of who he is, what we have in him. It's a, as, as one person mentioned, it's a God-taught understanding of the person and the work and the ways of Jesus Christ. We need to know what pleases God, what God requires of us, and how we can, uh, what pleases him, yes, even what displeases him. And so as we do that, we understand that comes through the word of God. And as we study the word of God together, we realize that both personally and together as we grow in the word of God, then we grow in our knowledge. And that's what God wants us to do. Yes, it involves knowledge in the head, but ultimately it means knowledge in our hearts and working out in our lives. And that's what God wants us to do. So then we come to this uh, third priority in our growth, and we notice that they all link together. You know, one is linked to the next one to the next one. And we said we, we need to be growing in each of these areas, but they kind of one builds a platform on another. And so to add to knowledge, we're told we're to add temperance. Now, temperance is a word that we don't really hear used very much today. Um, it was a, a word that's probably more from ages past. In fact, a hundred or so years ago, in, the late, or in fact, in the late 1800s and the early 1900s, there was a whole movement called the Temperance Movement. And you might know that the Temperance Movement was really uh, came into being because of the problems of alcoholism, particularly in the late 1800s and the early 1900s. You see, with the Industrial Revolution and people came into cities and they were working and things like that, particularly the men were working, a lot of them took to drinking. And they had wives and children and they would typically mistreat their wives and children and abandon them. And a lot of them would just descend into alcoholism and crime and all the things like that. And so out of that came a movement, a movement that was actually led by Christians, but also by women as well, who were really concerned about their husbands. And the temperance movement was designed to kind of encourage them to, to restrain themselves from drinking alcohol. And in fact, they encouraged laws to be put in place to, to prohibit or to restrict alcohol. Uh, in some cases, you know, in the early 1900s in America, there was the idea of prohibition, which says, you know, we're just going to outlaw alcohol. And then they would get people and they would have preachers and they would have people and trying to encourage them to abstain from alcohol. And they'd get them to sign these things called a, a temperance pledge, you know, that I'm not going to drink. I'm not going to go through that. Now, that ha had some benefits. Um, but as we'll see, the, the problem is when you're trying to just restrain from the outside and these people maybe don't really know Christ and they're, they're trying to do that, then it's, it has some limitations. So the idea of temperance, if we uh, look back to that, is, is the idea that um, it was the idea of not indulging yourself, particularly there with alcohol, uh, 
but it, it goes into other areas. Now, a little bit of history, um, in case you didn't know, and I, I was interesting a while ago, look, this, you know, our, our little town of Wonthaggy here began uh, in the early 1900s, late 1800s, early 1900s, began as a coal mining town. It was essentially a government set up town. And in those days, they wanted this town to be what they call a temperance town. Um, you see, the, the state premier at that time uh, was actually used to be a heavy drinker and he'd, he'd kind of reformed from that and he saw the dangers of, of excessive alcohol and all these things and so he really proposed that this town, because it was going to be a mining town and often there was a lot of alcohol in mining towns, a lot of you know, crime and, and mistreatment of people, he said, you know, we want to make one thaggy, a temperance town, to be free from alcohol. So originally when they established that, they had uh, temperance preachers, and this is the early Baptist church down here in one thaggy. They'd have meetings, and, and uh, even there's the Sunday school there, but they'd have meetings and try and discourage people from alcohol. And they really, in the early days, said, no, no, we, we're not going to have any pubs, we're not going to have anything like that. Well, that didn't last very long. <laughs> and if you know one thaggy, uh, in the early days, they said, well, you can't have a pub, but then there was this loophole that allowed people to have clubs, and it was said that there was... 12 different clubs in our little town of Wonthaggy. Each that they would have these different clubs and they'd serve the alcohol. And then, of course, the, uh, they started building and getting licenses to build uh, pubs. One of the early ones that's still there today, the Caledonian. It's, it's actually closed down at the moment, but uh, the building's still there. Uh, the State Mines Hotel, which is over near our house. Um, it's actually a, a bed and breakfast now. And then the, the one thaggy, we'll call it the Whalebone Hotel, they were some of the early ones. But of course, their, their efforts to try and stop that, people's desires were, no, no, we want to do that. And of course, it really, uh, that's one of the things we find is that, you know, often when you try to do things in your own strength and you try to reform society just by putting laws and things in without an inward transformation, it's, it's never really going to work. Now, coming back to this concept of temperance, so uh, temperance really, when we think about it in the context here, is not just referring to, uh, to alcohol. In fact, it's actually got a much broader meaning here. It just means, it means self-control. We are to control our bodily desires and appetites in line with what God's will is. Now, what we find is the Bible instructs us to numerous times, and particularly throughout the Bible in the New Testament, it says that we need to keep legitimate desires that we have within the boundaries that God has given us. Now think for a moment, a lot of the desires that we have that ultimately end up sinful, or most of them, are legitimate in the first place if they're properly understood. Let's, let's think about a few of these for a moment. Start with an easy one. Uh, Food and drink. It's a necessity to live. God has given us food and drink and uh, we need food not just to sustain our bodies, but you know, the good part is God made food to taste good and he gave us taste buds. You know, God could have given us just, it, it could have not given us taste buds and it could have been just like putting petrol in the car. You know, you put it in, it goes and all that sort of stuff. But you know, food's yummy. I like it. <laughs> Sometimes I like it too much. Um, and maybe today you're going to go home or we're going to have uh, morning tea after here. You're going to go home. You're going to enjoy a, a nice lunch. I'm looking forward to that. And I know you do. And sometimes I look forward to food too much. Um, and, uh, and I enjoy it too much. And that's one of the things. That, that can be for us sometimes, can't it? You know, it's, it's good that we have food. God's given us food. He actually wants us to enjoy it. But sometimes we can take it to extremes. Sometimes we can use food for the wrong things. We can use it to bring us comfort. We can use it, and this applies to drink and other things as well. We use it to escape the problems of our society. We can use it to indulge. And, and as a result, it brings about problems in our life, health problems and other problems. And, and so, you know, this is where self-control comes in. Food is a legitimate desire. God has supplied it as a legitimate item, but when we don't control it, when we let our bodily appetites get outside their God-given boundary, then it becomes, uh, to us, food and drink can become sinful to us. It's not sinful in itself, but our, our attachment to it, our habitual to it can be a problem. And so God says to us, we need to add to our virtue self-control or temperance. Think about another area. Our, our speech, our language. You know, God has given us as human beings the wonderful ability to talk to one another, to speak to one another. We can use words, we understand each other, and that's a God-given blessing. You know, animals can communicate, but not in the same way as we can. You know, and, a, and as I heard someone said, you know, a, 
a dog can't write a poem, and even if he barked out that poem, another dog couldn't understand it anyway. <laughs> so we have a, a unique ability that God's given us, and it's a, it's a God-given capacity to, to have words, to use words, to be able to speak to another, and we can use that for the glory of God. But it can also be terribly abused if it's not controlled. We must control our tongue. You know, we can hurt others with our words by what we say, by our anger, the way we say it, the tone in which we say things. Maybe there's things that we shouldn't say at certain times that we need to withhold our tongue. And, you know, we need to think about that. We also can uh, use our words in a damaging way of speaking gossip or speaking ill of other people. Sometimes about, you know, we need to, to learn to control our, our tongue. You know, James talks about that, you know, he talks about in his book about the fact that we need to learn to control the tongue. And he actually says that, you know, out of the same mouth can, he says, you know, there's blessing and there's cursing. And he says that shouldn't be. So we need to learn to uh, have some control over our speech. We need to submit it to God, as it were. We need to exercise some self-control and some, some temperance. Another area, sex. It's God's idea. You know, God created it, God ordained it, God designed it for not just human reproduction, but it brings, of course, pleasure as well uh, with the sexual union. That's God's design, it's God's idea. God's not against sex, he's not opposed to it. And God is glorified when we use our God-given sexuality in the way that God designed it. But God set boundaries as well. God set boundaries that commanded it to be with, uh, between, within the boundaries of marriage between a man and a woman. I have to add a man and a woman today because you know, people try to redefine marriage. You know, Hebrews 13 says marriage in 13.4, marriage is honourable in all and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. And in numerous times we're told to, in scripture, to flee fornication. That means sexual immorality. That's not just the practice of it. It can also be the desires of it as well. You know, we see today the rise of, you know, just sensuality, pornography, all those sorts of things. And God says, no, that's wrong. There's boundaries that God has set. And those boundaries are for our own good. You think about, even with that whole issue of sexuality, you think about if we kept within God's given boundaries, how many, how fewer problems we'd have and all sorts of issues and problems that come from that and, and then also, uh, you know, all the, all the perversions of that as well and all of the things, you know. The, God has given us that, that wonderful gift of sex, but it's to be used in God's way. We need to, again, exercise temperance or self-control. Material possessions. God's created us to live in a material world and uh, we need not only food and clothing, we need um, a place to, to live in, some shelter and a home. And today, you know, pretty much all of us need some form of transportation to get around. It's pretty difficult to get along without it. And in the age that we live and the society we live now, we probably have even, there's probably a lot more things that we need than people did from past days as well. You know, we understand that. Now, the thing is, the Bible doesn't indicate that, he just, that God just wants us, expects us to get along with just the barest necessities in life. You know, we are to be thankful and content, as it says, with just food and raiment. But God also will bless and provide not just our needs, but he can, and will provide, can provide beyond that. And we see many examples of godly men uh, in the Bible that God blessed with much more than the bare necessities. So material possessions in themselves are not wrong. We understand that. But we also know how easily it is for us to get out of those boundaries, to really become obsessed with material things, to focus on those. You know, they can easily steal away our hearts, our affection, and we can, in some ways, you know, they can become idols for us. And we find today we live in Australia in probably one of the wealthiest countries in the world. We have so much at our disposal, but there's also so much we can pursue, so much we can buy, there's so much shopping we can do, so many things we can go after. And, and you know, there is a temptation there, particularly with the society that says, you know, hey, don't wait, buy it now, pay later. You know, the, the recent rise of things like after pay, you know, buy it now, pay in four, you know, <laughs> all those sorts of things that are going on. Um, and it really just to try and encourage people to pursue that. And we need to, you know, maybe you think to yourself, well, I'm, I'm not 
I don't pursue riches, I'm not after wealth, but there's so many things, sometimes possessions can really just get in our way. We can become overly uh, consumed with that. And we need to realise that, you know, God has given us things to enjoy. You know, in 1 Timothy 6, he says, Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, uh, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. We have blessings from God, but let's not look at the things. We need to look at God and we need to give thanks to God. And we need to, as it were, hold lightly onto the things of this world. They're all going to go. They're all going to disappear. And we shouldn't make them our aim. So as we see, these are just a few of the areas in which we need to exercise this self-control, this restraint. You know, when our legitimate desire uh, that God gives us goes beyond the boundaries which God has, has set for us, it becomes sinful, it becomes harmful. And, you know, self-control learns how to keep within those boundaries, you know, and not necessarily go, well, how close to the boundary can I go? You know, it's like, no, I need to, to restrain myself and to do so because we know it's pleasing to God and that also it's, it's right for us as well. See, God doesn't set up those those boundaries, as it were, so that, you know, just to, to be mean to us and say, you can't go there, you can't do it. They're actually for our good, if you stop to look at it. Problem is, we live in a society today that loves to walk up and just kick down the boundaries and just walk past them and say, I don't like any boundaries, I don't want them. And, and the, the, the sad part is that many of us as Christians, okay, we won't go that far, but now we kind of follow a little bit behind. And we don't realise in following a little bit behind, we've already crossed some of those boundaries. Okay, we're not doing what the world does in those areas, but we're still overstepping those boundaries. And this is why we need to learn to develop and cultivate self-control. Add to our faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge self-control. Now, one of the things when we think about the term self-control, we can be a little bit misleading because we can think of the self part of it and think that this is something that we can do in our own strength, that we can generate in our own strength. And there's been people throughout history that have tried to do it. There was a, a group of Greek, uh, you know, in this time of the Greek society there, there were what they call the Stoics that were very much like, well, I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to limit myself. I'm not going to touch. I'm not going to eat. I'm not going to do this. I'm going to do that. And I'm going to, in my own strength, I'm going to do this. And you read about um, some of the ancient ones that did that. But what they found was, as they did that, they just got lifted up in pride. And they fell into pride, thought, hey, look how good I am. And then they ended up falling from that. You know, it, 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 they may have had some restraint, but it wasn't God-glorifying restraint. And it wasn't God-focused restraint. For us as believers, we're not to try and do this in our own strength. Now, it will require some effort on our part, but God is the one we're told who is who's working in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So if we want to please God, we want to uh, have this, these uh, self-control in these areas, then we need to first surrender ourselves to God and say, look, God, I can't do this. I need your help. And I'm willing to work on it, but I need you to work in and through me. And of course he does. You know, in ultimately what we're talking about here is not us controlling ourselves, but us yielding ourselves to the control of God, to the control of Christ or the control of the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 6 reminds us of this. In verses 11 through 13, Paul says, Likewise, reckon yourselves to be dead unto sin, but alive unto to God in to Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin reign in your mortal, mortal body that you may obey the lust thereof. Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves to God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. What Paul's saying here is that, you know, understand God has broken the power of sin in your life you don't need to sin you don't need to follow those desires but you do need to surrender those desires to god you can if you want follow them and you will find yourself time and time falling into those habits but if you again yield yourself to god and say god i need your help i don't want to cross these boundaries so lord help me to stay within those boundaries and he will give you help with that as we yield ourselves to the Holy Spirit, we won't have to fill, fill those desires of our sin nature. We can obey God. He will help us 
He's given us, as we, Peter's already told us, all the things that pertain to life and godliness. As I said, too often what we do is we, we, we struggle with that and then we just give way. You know, we sort of go, oh, I messed up again. Lord, I'm sorry. You know, and we fall into that. And, and then we think, okay, well, I'll go back. Well, you know, that, that becomes sort of like a very discouraging and defeating sort of uh, practice. What we need to learn is to learn to live by faith faith that God can help us in this and we need to say you know in that we do need to show some self-restraint ask God to help us with that if we don't what we end up doing is just becoming a habit to those sins maybe those old sins that you used to have or maybe even new sins that the world's trying to push upon you you know Paul said in first Corinthians he said all things are lawful uh, uh, for unto me but not all but all things are not expedient all things are lawful to me but I will not have be brought under the power of any in other words, he says, there's desires that I have, but I'm not going to let those desires control me. I'm not going to be under their control. I'm going to be under uh, the Spirit's control. I'm going to allow the Holy Spirit to control me. And so we need to look at that and say, you know, for us, we need to, uh, to surrender ourselves to the Lord in this area. And, and there'll be things that we understand, things that God says, no. You're not to do that. That's why we need, by the way, the knowledge that comes before. We need the virtue that says the commitment, I'm going to live for Christ, I'm going to live a godly life. And then we need the, the knowledge to say, well, what does that godly life look like? look like? What things do we need to put off? What things do we need to put on? And then we need to exercise self-control, control of ourselves submitted to God to say, you know, hey, uh, when this comes along, Lord, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this again. And, uh, and Lord, I want you to show me these areas. And sometimes, you know, as, as we read the word of God, God brings back to a reminder, hey, you know, don't speak that word of gossip. Don't speak that, don't say that thing, or don't, yeah, maybe don't eat or drink that thing, or maybe don't go there, don't, uh, uh, to, to follow these particular areas of sin. That requires, you know, that self-effort is something like I said, unfortunately in the church today, a lot of people, or that self-control uh, that we have, uh, unfortunately, a lot of people in the church today don't want to don't want to consider that. They consider that that's too restrictive. But as you said, God gives us these boundaries for a reason. Self control or temperance, we're to add, and then He says to that we are to add patience. Patience here um, means to to remain under, the word means to, to stay under or remain under, and it's frequently used in the New Testament to refer to the endurance or to remain constant under some sort of external pressure or weight. You know, often we think about patience as being, you know, sort of just having to wait for something, but this is also saying, no, that while you're waiting, there's all sorts of things going on from the outside. And in fact, this is how it's connected to self-control. You know, self-control is handling all the pleasures of life, the, the, the things that are internal, as it were. Patience is dealing with how do we deal with the problems of life, as it were, the trials. As one commentator said, you know, temperance or self-control addresses life's pleasures in a God-honouring way, but patience addresses life's difficulties in a God-honouring way. And we know... We're all familiar with the fact that life can be tough sometimes. There can be all sorts of trials. Trials in our health, trials in our relationships, trials in our finances, trials in just how other people are treating us, and then sometimes just the things of living in a fallen world. All of these things, uh, you know, weigh upon us heavily, and it's very easy for us to kind of just, you know, as it were, give up. And often this is how it's linked, the patience is linked to self-control. You know, you may be working on some areas of self-control in your life where you say, hey, I don't want to do this or whatever. But then along come these trials and, and they're having, and then you just go, look, oh, I give up. Let's go eat chocolate or whatever we're going to do. Have another drink, watch another movie, whatever it is that we're going to, I was saying. Anyway, the, the idea is that we tend to, why? Because of the pressures that are going on outside uh, in our lives. Now, we need to understand that, um, you know, God, just as God wants us to, to stay within the legitimate boundaries as far as our self-control goes, God has also got a purpose and plan in the trials. 
you know, it's not just gritting your teeth through the trials. That's the Stoics again. They're just saying, like, I'm just, I'm just going to get through this. I'm going to work my way through it. No, it's, it's remaining faithful to God because God is the one that is bringing us through and will bring us through the trials. God's involved here and it's his glory that's at stake. You know, patience isn't something that uh, develops automatically. You know, we need to grow in it. Um, James tells us that the trying of our faith worketh patience. And so we understand that one of the ways we develop patience with endurance, of this idea of endurance and, and steadfastness, and similar words in this thing, is that, that we would uh, remain under trials uh, at times when God allows them in our lives. Now, none of us like trials. But God uses them in our lives to help us to look to him, to trust him. Again, the aim of all of this is not to do it in our own strength. Our aim is to rely upon the Lord. And in fact, James tells us that even in these times of trials where we lack wisdom, we can ask God and he will supply wisdom to us and that he will also help us through these things. And so this is why we know that God even works in these trials for our good and for his glory. As one writer put, patience is that ability to remain faithful to God under pressure because your heart continually looks to God in faith for strength and reward. Now, Peter, we know in his first letter, talked a lot about that. We think back to 1 Peter chapter 1 and he talks about that, you know, uh, the, the, the inheritance that's laid up before us. And he goes down to verse 6 and says, Wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are heav in heaviness through manifold temptations. In other words, it might be necessary. There might be a time where you're going through some trials. See, we would love to uh, have everything just happen peachy and everything to go right in our life. But, you know, often, too often, when things are going, everything's going good, we don't look to God. And God allows these things in our life so that we will look to him, not in a mean way, but in a loving way. What he's trying to say is, you know, you, you need to look to me because I'm the one that can not only meet your needs, but I'm the answer to all your problems. And in fact, uh, I am the one that will sustain you through these things. The, the trying, uh, trial or the testing of your faith being much more than gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found... Uh, unto the praise and honour and the glory of the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom, having not seen you love, in whom, though you not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. So we understood that in First Peter, the way that we live in a hostile world uh, is to understand that this world is not all there is. And that we have a hope that is awaiting us in heaven. There's a future reward and that will encourage us to remain faithful and to, pers uh, to, to persevere, to remain steadfast, to have patience during trials. You and I can uh, rejoice in difficult circumstances if we know that there is something at the end of it. And, and often we'll do that, you know, when you're going through, uh, even recently, you know, people have had surgery and they go through that. And they know if there's recovery from that, there's an improvement in their health. They're willing to go through that pain to get to that improved health. And just as we, in our, the trials that we have, we know that there is something much greater that awaits us. And it is, of course, the, the glory that we will receive at Christ's return as we look to him, as we look to the promises that God tells us. It helps us also not only to have patience, but to have self-control. Peter, a little further on, says, Wherefore, he says, Gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end, for the grace is to be brought to you in the revelation of Jesus Christ. You know, he's saying, Gird up the loins of your mind, be sober. That's really the idea of self-control. Why? We can be self-controlled because we have a, a glorious hope of the return of Jesus Christ and all things will be put right. There'll be no more pain. There'll be no more sorrow. There'll be, and everything will be made right at, at, and at Christ's return that we be with him. So that sort of attitude will not only develop patience in our life, but it will also develop that self-control. And Jesus Christ is the picture that we're told to look at. You know, in our opening this morning, in our call to worship, we read those verses and I want to share them with you again. 
it reminds us that we can run this Christian race. It's, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon, that we can run it with patience and endurance because of Christ who set the example for us. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 says, Wherefore, seeing as we're compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and every sin which doth so easily beset us. That's the self-control part. And let us run the race with patience, you know, with perseverance, with endurance, with steadfastness, the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of God. And we can have temperance, we can have self-control, we can have perseverance or patience or endurance because Jesus Christ paved the way for us, as it were. He was the one that was perfect in that. And because God is working to build in us Christ-likeness, he will develop that. Now, of course, not to the same level as Jesus. He was perfect in that. But this side of heaven, we're continuing to grow in that. And we realise it's as we look to the Lord Jesus Christ that we will be able to grow in these areas. Add to knowledge temperance or self-control and to temperance, patience, these are things that we need to add to our life. They may not be the most exciting things, the most newest sort of teachings, but this is good teaching. This is right. This is what we need. And as we, we focus on these things, as we grow in the Lord, it will not only help us to be pleasing to the Lord, but it will keep us from those things which will draw us away and deceive us. And that's what Peter's telling us today. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for our time together in your word and thank you for the reminder of our need for both self-control, temperance and patience. Lord, we understand that these are things we cannot do in ourselves. But Lord, we do uh, understand that it's only through our, our looking to you and our yielding to you as well. Lord, we know that there's times when we are tempted in, in many areas. There's different areas we've thought about today in each of those areas, we've might, we would no doubt have faced and continue to face temptations. The world around us is continually tempting us to, to really do things our own way, to kind of ignore your, your commands, your boundaries. And yet, Lord, we want to be pleasing to you. We know that these boundaries are not just, uh, to, they're not just for your glory, they're also for our good. And yet they are for your glory and we want to glorify you. So, Lord, we pray you'd help us with these things and then also with patience as well. Lord, I know many people here going through some trials at the moment, different trials in their health, maybe in their, in their relationships, in, in different struggles that they're going through. And I ask, Lord, that you would help them, Lord, to continue to remain under, uh, Lord, uh, the, the, the situation they're in, but to remain under in terms of remaining faithful to you. That's our desire, Lord. We know that you use these trials in our lives. Lord, none of us uh, really love the trial and we're not supposed to love the trial, but we're to love you through the trial. And so we pray that you would help us to continue to look to you and to look to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith and for the one who went before us as it were, endured the cross and went through the suffering and, and uh, had both the temperance and the patience, Lord, so that we might be able to walk in his steps and to follow his example. We can only do that through your power and by your grace. And so we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.